here and making himself known. And it is so great to see Michelle we walk in that back door. Ooh, wow, another victory. I told Karen, uh, I guess it was late Sunday evening when we got the word that Dane had given his heart to Jesus after decades of resistance. I told Karen this is going to be the week of victories. Amen. And her parents turned right around and got COVID. <laughs> well, I guess there's not a victory without a fight. Amen. Yeah. And Shelby's a victory. We're thankful that you're well enough to be with us. Yeah. Shelby and Maria, bless you. I know it's been a tough week for both of you. And we're thankful that you're here. Pray for Pete, who's out chasing deer. He did get one. Big one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He sent me the picture. Yeah, he's going off. Yeah. Bless his heart. He shot Bambi. <laughs> but it's just good to be in the house of the Lord with God's people. Our brothers and sisters in the faith. And to know that we are not making this journey alone. I was at a training uh, the last two days over in the Durham area. And we were talking about how to do mentoring. And one of the thoughts that kept coming up is that uh, we are all on a journey. Life is a journey, a spiritual journey, especially for those who have put their faith in Christ and and we come into this journey in different times and different places. It's like driving down the road, you know. You, you may be on a long trip like I was yesterday, and you get on the interstate up in somewhere near <clears throat> Burlington, and, and you're driving along, and you see other vehicles come into the flow of traffic, and some stay with you for a long time, and others hit the next exit, and they're gone. And, but uh, the journey of faith is, is kind of like that. You know, we make a decision to get on the, the highway and to move toward our destination. And we see other people come in along the way. But there are other people that were already on the journey before we ever hit the interstate. And we travel with some of them and we play leapfrog along the way. <laughs> right. And uh, when our exit comes, we take the exit. Others continue on. And that's that's the journey of life and uh, discipleship that we're all on together. Uh, some continue on and some come in for a short period of time and make a quick exit. But as long as they come in, right? That's what matters. Uh, we had a, another discussion this weekend uh, about that uh, parable of the, the man who hired the workers and and hired some early in the day and some later in the morning and some in the afternoon and some in the late afternoon. And, and at the end of the day, they all got the same wage. And the ones that were hired earlier thought, well, this isn't fair. We worked all day long. And we get the same as those who didn't come in until an hour before we finished. And, and the landowner says, is it not my money to do with as I please? <laughs> Did I not promise you this amount of money? When you started, take what's yours and go. And since he was referring to making a, a comparison to heaven and the kingdom of heaven, that denarius is everlasting life. So how can you be given more than one? What would you do with it? <laughs> You'll never spend the first one. So what do you need with more than one? Right? But uh, we, we serve a, a loving God and a just God and a, more importantly, a gracious God Amen. who gives us what we do not deserve. Right. Even whether we start the journey early in the day or late in the day, doesn't really matter. We will never deserve it. Amen. Amen. And we're blessed. And, but it, uh, it, there have been some victories this week and we're thankful for that. And uh, we're, sometimes we need to be thankful even for the struggles because they make us stronger and there's their proof that there is a victory out there somewhere waiting for us. If we just keep struggling, don't give up. 
Don't give up. Jesus was talking about such things in the passage that we read just a few minutes ago. Here as we get closer to the end of the ecclesiastic church year and the scripture readings that go along with that yearly plan, we're getting feeling a lot more lately with the end of times, as you may have noticed, uh, because the next thing will be Advent, and we start the life of Christ and following that and all that means again at that time. So we're, we're really close to the end of the preaching calendar, you might say, this year. And you may have noticed I've been talking about last things a little bit lately. Last week I talked about the fact that resurrection and judgment are coming. And it's, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. And that is the trillion dollar question. <laughs> uh, billion just doesn't sound as impressive anymore, does it? <laughs> or even billions, we're throwing trillions around. Like, that's, like it's real money and stuff. <laughs> But Jesus addresses the question of when in this passage. And he begins with a discourse, uh, this, this discourse with a foreboding statement regarding the temple itself. And one which actually came true just a few decades after he made this statement. But, and that was that not one stone of the temple would remain upon another. Every one of them would be thrown down. In the year 67 AD, the Jews revolted against Rome, and the Romans responded and broke through Jerusalem's defenses after a 10-month-long siege in which as many as a million Jews were said to have been living held up inside the city walls, anywhere from 650,000 to a million, depending on your source. After breaking through the newest wall and the weakest part of that outer wall and breaching the inner wall, the legion from Rome punished the city by removing most of its citizens and by destroying the city and its temple, raising everything to the ground except for one wall which still remains. And maybe that was left there just as a reminder of what happens to those who resist Rome's power. After the first Jewish-Roman War, which that came to be known as, the city was under reconstruction as a new Roman city called Colonia Aelia Capitolina. And among the projects in that reconstruction was the building of a temple to Jupiter, the Roman god of sky and thunder, and considered to be the king of gods. And they built this temple on the former Temple Mount. This, among other things, that upset the remaining Jews led to further Jewish revolts. There were successive wars fought between the Jews and the Romans. One such war was led by a, name, a man by the name of Simon Bar Korkba, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which uh, resulted in a three-year-long period of Jewish self-rule <clears throat> that was later crushed by the Romans and led to large-scale depopulation of the region. Bar Kokhba ruled under the title Nasi, N-A-S-I, meaning head of state. But many Jews at the time, after especially, well, while he was ruling, they considered him to be the Messiah. But when he was defeated and the region was depopulated, rabbinical leaders began referring to him as Simon ben Kusaba which means the son of deception, since it was determined that he was a false messiah. Does this have anything to do with the scripture reading that we shared a minute ago? Yes. Of course, whenever there's a siege, there, is invariably, there are invariably food shortages, starvation, sickness, disease, all of which Jesus foretold. But it's interesting that Jesus said before all of this, they will seize you and persecute you and hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. I love this part. Verse 13. And so you will bear testimony to me. 
but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Now, how can this? How can these two realities coexist? <laughs> how can you be persecuted and put to death, but not a hair of your head perish? Well, he's not talking about physical hair necessarily. He's talking about your spiritual body. Stand firm, he says, and you will win life. Even if they put you to death, apparently. And we know from the accounts of Paul and Peter and others that these things did, in fact, occur starting not long after Jesus ascended to the Father. We know that Stephen was soon stoned to death. But as he was being stoned to death, he looked up into the heavens and he said, Look, I see the Lord standing at the right hand of my Father. Amen. All but one of the apostles died martyrs' deaths. And that one, John the Beloved, or John the Revelator, was the only one to die of old age. And that isn't because they didn't try to kill him, but he survived. How then could Jesus promise, like I said, not a hair of your head will perish, but because of the resurrection and everlasting life, which is promised to those who believe and are faithful even unto death. As I said last week, everyone will die. Unless Jesus comes back first, which would be great. But death does not have to have the final word. I have given instructions to my family that there is a song to be played. Uh, if and when I pass before them. That at my uh, funeral. And it's, it's a Petra song. Which is, Petra is a Christian rock group. Back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And uh, they sang a song called The Grave Robber. And Jesus is the grave robber. And death doesn't get the final word. Amen. In fact, death itself, we're told, will regurgitate its dead, and then death will be cast into the lake of fire. So death's, death's future is sealed as well. We don't have to be afraid of death. Death doesn't get the last word. If we choose to believe in and follow and obey the Lord, death is only a portal to an even more glorious existence that will last forever with the Heavenly Father. So then, what should be our posture as we wait for this eventual return of Jesus and the beginning of this amazing existence that we're going to have with Him and the rest of the church? Paul had this to say to the Thessalonian believers in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. He said, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Maybe that last line is for all of us. Never tire of doing what is good. We may get physically tired, and sometimes we may even get a little spiritually depleted. But there's a, there's a remedy for that. That's time with the Lord. Even Jesus took time to get away from the disciples and the masses who followed him to spend time with the Father in prayer. There's a story about a minister who announced that he was going to take vacation for the next week or so. 
to let his congregation know he was going to be gone and unavailable during that time. And someone came to him after service that Sunday morning and said, Preacher, he says, I don't know why you get to take a vacation. Satan doesn't take a vacation. So the pastor took that, thought with him, went home, did some study in the afternoon, and came back with a list of the number of times that it says, and Jesus got away from the disciples and the crowds to spend time in prayer, in prayer with the Father, commune with the Father. And so he shared that list that night and didn't name the person, but said that he had been told this after the morning service, that Satan doesn't take a vacation. And then he posed the question, which, who would you rather your pastor be like, Satan or Jesus? <laughs> we are met with this concept, <laughs> once again, of being busy doing the Lord's work and not, and not uh, perseverating on when the end is going to come. That word perseverate, you know what that means? It means just you know, being hung up on it. <laughs> Don't forget what Jesus said just before he ascended to the Father for the last time when he was asked if he was going to restore the kingdom right then. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, don't stick your nose in God's business. Just do what he's given you to do. Take care of your own. And this isn't just busy work. I remember in school when the teacher had to take a break and leave the class, she, he or she would give us an assignment to do while they were out of the class. And it was just busy work, and we knew it. But, you know, when they, they come back and they collect it and there would be a grade that's attached to it. So we'd better do the work. <laughs> but this isn't just busy work that the Lord's given us to do. This is a privilege to be a part of his mission. Jesus came, taught, healed, preached, suffered, died and rose again and ascended to the Father. And he left all of that in the hands of about 120 faithful disciples, maybe as many as 500 who saw him after he was raised from the dead. And his work, his, but, 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 excuse me, the Bible tells me, I'm getting ahead of myself, the Bible tells us that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work's done. He, you could say he swung his licks, so to speak. And, but he is still interceding for us, which is good news. Not totally done. But he has left the work for us to continue, to carry on. And yes, there is going to be a day when that uh, we, we, will, we will all find the exit, either one at a time, or all together. Karen and I were coming back from the beach about three or four years ago, and they were doing some work in the Charlotte area on one of the major highways. And we came to a point in the road, and this was major, like six lane or more highway, and the road just stopped. There were signs, road ends, there was no road. I mean, the road had been torn up. And we had no choice but to exit there and to try to figure out, to work our way through the neighborhoods and the side streets to get through Charlotte. It was not fun. <laughs> it took a long time for us to finally get back onto a major thoroughfare and uh, continue the trip home. But we were, we were exhausted just by the time we got back on the main road. <laughs> And, of course, the, the backups were horrible, which helped to make it not fun. But we're all going to reach the end of the road someday. Whether we do it one at a time or whether we do it collectively when he returns, we can rest assured that day is coming. The end of life on earth, as we have known it, is going to arrive. 
there's an old song, it's old now, that asks the question, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? It's one way to describe what it means to be doing the Lord's work while we await his return. It's hard to believe that we are living in a day in which right here in America people are being fined for doing the Lord's work. There was one group of one church that was even fined and is continuing, as far as I know, to be fined for operating a soup kitchen. Here we are. It's a group that feeds the hungry inside a church. Well, the city wants them to stop, and it's fining them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the priest leading that group turned to help me Howard with Patrick Frazier. The roads will have traffic, the beaches will have sand, and Father Bob will have food for the hungry. We do every day, twice a day, is feeding the poor, and we have for 31 years. Father Bob is the pastor at All Saints Catholic Mission in Oakland Park, where 200 people a day get a hot meal. Delicious food, huh? Food donated by companies, handed out by volunteers, and enjoyed by the hungry inside a cool church sanctuary, where Father Bob counsels and consoles. It's just, you know, this is a religious place, and religion by its very definition is trying to get people closer to God and helping them. from the city of Oakland Park, a lot of headings. They came and served me paper, cease and desist. Can't serve anymore. Oakland Park ordered the church to stop feeding the poor back in 2014. Father Bob, who's read the 2,000 passages in the Bible that say, feed the poor, listen to the Lord instead. I told the police officers who delivered it, I'm not going to stop, so if you want to arrest me, arrest me now. Oakland Park didn't arrest Father Bob. Instead, they started fining him $125 every single day. Thanksgiving, Christmas, it doesn't matter to the city. It's close to 200000 someone told me, so it's getting up there. What makes Father Bob smile, some of the politicians who are fining him tell him they're fine with what he's doing. And these new ones said, we're going to... Uh, be a kinder, more compassionate group. And when they talk to me privately, oh, we're on your side. But since Father Bob believes the city wants the kitchen gone to redevelop the area, the politicians change sides. They're not supporting us. Uh, there's a lot of duplicity <laughs> in our politicians. So while the hungry eat, a priest often offers a prayer for relief from the city's daily fines. They could just bring it up on the agenda and eliminate it. It's, it's a very simple operation. Legally, can a city find a church for feeding the poor inside a sanctuary? Howard? This type of move by a commission to try to force out a religious group is against the law. The Florida legislature and U.S. Congress have both passed laws to protect churches who feed the poor. And by ignoring prior cases, Oakland Park could cost their taxpayers a lot of money if they do not wipe out the fines. I sent Oakland Park nine questions such as, does the city plan to place a lien on the church and try to foreclose on the property? And has the city find other religious organizations that are helping the homeless? The city refused to answer a single question, instead sending a statement saying the church must follow the law and be in compliance with the code. The statement signed by the city of Oakland Park ended with, we have invited them to meet with us to find a resolution. Our door remains open when they're ready to discuss this pending matter. I read that to Father Bob. I think they lied. Uh, never been invited to a meeting with them. Never. Fines every day for eight years. Time, Father Bob says. It's time. Leave us alone. We'll see you guys at breakfast tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day. Clearly, Father Bob and his volunteers will not stop feeding the hungry, no matter how much the city finds it. Now, if you'd like to help, maybe donate food, clothes, or money, the link is at WSVN.com under this Help Me Howard story. <clears throat> this is just one example of how Christians are being beginning to be targeted and persecuted right here in America for exercising their faith. You may recall a Christian bakery out in Colorado that was persecuted by the town for years 
for refusing to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding that would have violated their conscience. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court before it was thrown out. And the same thing happened, happened with Christian-owned Hobby Lobby for refusing for, to provide abortion services to its workers through their health insurance policies. The Supreme Court also finally had to weigh in on that case, too, and found in favor of Hobby Lobby. The question is, how many Christian-owned businesses had been bullied into abandoning their consciences because they didn't want the hassle and the cost and the bad publicity that goes with fighting the system. These are just warning shots, I believe, in a war against Christianity that is being prepared for just the right moment, so we had better be prepared. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if possible, financially, for those wars when they come. But God is not swayed or deterred by the whims of human politicians. As he declared in Isaiah 65, 17 through 25, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a, a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of the tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, and they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Amen. This will be great news for those who love and serve the Lord faithfully. In Isaiah 12, beginning at verse 1, we read, I will praise you, Lord. Although you are angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. But for those who are not faithful or obedient, that day will not be a day of rejoicing, but rather a day of anguish and despair, even while God's children rejoice. In Malachi 4, 1 and 2, we read, Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. The end. So there's, there's bad news and then there's good news. You could say there's good news and there's bad news and there's good news. Good news is God loves us. Bad news is we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we're all worthy of punishment, everlasting punishment. But the good news is that God in Christ has provided a, 
a way out, a salvation for us, that we don't have to endure that. And now, it remains in your hands to decide which will be your outcome. What will be your destination when you finally take that last exit? Will you go to everlasting life and joy and paradise and peace? Or will you go to a place and an existence that is too horrific for words to describe? I think, you know, the Bible tells us that eye has not seen nor has ear heard nor has it entered into the hearts of man the wonders and the glories that God has prepared for those who love him. But I think on the other extreme, the same can be said about the fate of those that do not love him. Do not trust him. Eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the horrors that await for those who do not love the Lord. My father-in-law tells a story that happened to him of a, of a young man whose father passed away and who did not live for the Lord. Now, it's not our place ever as a pastor or a family member or friend to say where someone ended up. We don't know what happened in their minds in those last few seconds. We know we serve a gracious God. All we can say is what we have seen on the outside, and that may or may not look good. And that's pretty much what he responded by saying. And the young man said, well, if my daddy didn't go to heaven, I don't want to go to heaven because I want to be where my daddy is because I love my daddy and my daddy loved me. The, the bad news is that there's no love outside heaven. There is no love in that other place. There's only self. And if, I, I shared this story recently about Johnny Carson interviewing Billy Graham and asking him, do you really believe there's a literal heaven and a literal hell? And Billy Graham responded by asking, well, if there is, which one would you rather go to? Carson thought for a minute and then quipped, well, I'd probably rather go to hell. All my friends will be there. But there won't be friends in hell. I pray that Johnny had a chance to recant that before he left this world. I really do. But we have to choose which kind of existence is it going to be when we hit that off-ramp. And we don't know when the off-ramp is going to come. You know, Dane Smith might live another hundred years. And any one of us might slip out this week. I hesitate to say that. Lord, don't let me put words in But it's the truth. We don't know. And we need to be prepared at any given moment to stand before him and give an account for how we treated him and his sacrifice and whether or not we were busy doing his work when the end came for us. Are we busy? Are we... Are we going to be, like I said last week, are we going to be the ones that say, hang on, Lord, I'm not quite done yet doing your work? Or are we going to be sitting there saying, what took you so long? I don't think this crowd's going to be happy about the outcome, to be honest. Jesus said, whoever, this is a faithful servant who's busy doing my work. That's the one who, who will be blessed. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> now, if that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, you, you may want to check and see if you got any left. <laughs> stand with me and let us close with this word of uh, benediction. Would you, uh, and hold out your hands to receive this as you share it with one another. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
God bless you. Have a blessed day in the Lord. And keep working till you hit that off ramp. We'll see you soon. God bless you.